Welcome. Welcome to our candidate uh, open forum this afternoon. We surely appreciate you being here today. Um, so the ISU faculty and staff, we have the uh, uh, open forum for our candidate. My name is Gene Warren. I am the faculty senate co-chair and a member of the ISU uh, presidential search committee. The committee chair asked that I facilitate this forum. If you have a comment about our candidates, please go to the presidential uh, search, um, the website there and do your comments, please. That information will go directly to the uh, State Board of Education. We appreciate the time our candidate has taken to visit with us today. We only have about 45 minutes uh, to visit with them, so we need uh, to set a few ground rules uh, in this forum in order to have everyone have a chance to ask a question. Uh, first of all, please limit your question uh, to one minute or less and ask only one question. We ask that our candidate be brief and stay on topic when answering the questions. Uh, if there is time near the end of the forum, I will invite some additional questions, uh, but we need to uh, end on time because our candidate has an appointment right at uh, 5 o'clock. So we need to make sure that they meet that appointment. Uh, there are mics up uh, front here, and there's one in the middle. Either one of those would work, and I will call on you to uh, start your questioning. So with that, let me introduce um, uh, Mr. Or Dr. Charles A. White. Uh, he was the, he was the uh, 12th president of Weber State University. Um, it is a, dis, uh, is a distinguished scholar and academic leader with more than three decades of experience in higher education. Among his accomplishments are the signing of a, town, a college town charter with Ogden City and leading the university during the public phase of its Dream 125 comprehensive fundraising campaign that raised more than $164 million in support of the university. Under White's uh, guidance, the university expanded eligibility for its Dream Weaver program, which provides up to eight semesters of full tuition and fees for eligible uh, low-income students. During White's administration, Weaver State uh, established a $3 million uh, presidential outstanding teaching endowment to support faculty teaching grants and awards. Prior to his, appoint to his appointment at Weber State, White served three years as Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Utah, where he also served in other administrative and faculty roles since, 19, uh, since 1984. A physical chemist, he researches the chemistry of explosives and rocket propellants. He is the co-author of more than 160 peer-reviewed publications, three patent filings, and two books. White was named, an, uh, was named an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow and was designated a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is a member of the Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society. White received the University of Utah's 1985 Outstanding Teacher Award in Chemistry from students and has also reviewed or received uh, the R.W. Perry Teaching Award in Chemistry. Uh, White is married to Victoria uh, Rasmussen and is the father of three adult daughters. In his free time, he enjoys golf, fly fishing, and serving as a volunteer command pilot for Angel Flight West, a nonprofit charity providing free non-emergency medical transportation for patients with compelling needs. Please welcome Dr. Charles White. Yes, it's on. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is a really important decision that the university is making, and I am honored by the opportunity uh, to interview here for uh, the position of president. It's, uh, it's very exciting for me. Um, I want to introduce myself uh, just briefly uh, for you. And um, 
I'll start by saying that uh, my family and I started out on the East Coast. My parents are both uh, school teachers, were both school teachers. Um, uh, they're from New York and Connecticut area. My father moved the family to Northern Virginia when I was a boy, and so I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, went to uh, school at the University of Virginia where I earned a degree in chemistry. Uh, went to graduate school at Caltech where I earned a PhD in chemistry. Then spent a couple of years at the University of Colorado as a postdoc, and uh, then took my first uh, permanent job teaching chemistry at the University of Utah in 1984. That makes me 62 years old for those of you who are doing this, the math. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so when I got to the University of Utah, people asked me, well, how long are you going to stay? And I said, I don't know, five, six, seven years, we'll see how it goes, and I'll look around and see what's available. And the longer I stayed in Utah, the better I liked it, and I ended up uh, staying at the University of Utah for 29 years, teaching chemistry and doing various other jobs. Um, and then I had an amazing opportunity to drive 35 miles up the road to Weber State University, where I've been president for the last five and a half years or so. Um, people sometimes ask me about the path that I took to the presidency, and most of you will be familiar with the fact that the usual path uh, involves um, you know, b being a faculty member, becoming the chair of your department, becoming the dean of your college, maybe becoming an associate provost and then a provost, and, and then maybe having an opportunity uh, to uh, become president. I didn't do any of those things. Uh, I was never the chair of my department. I was never the dean of my college. I was never a provost. I took kind of the long way around uh, and um, started off actually being the president of the Academic Senate at the University of Utah. Uh, they, that, they call it the Academic Senate instead of the Faculty Senate because there are students on it uh, as well. And after the Academic Senate, um, I uh, became involved in administration, supporting online courses, students and faculty support for online courses, which were fairly new back in the very early 2000s. Uh, and then they asked me to run continuing education for a while, and I got some experience running a staff organization. And after that, it was back to undergraduate studies, where I was in charge of all the general ed education uh, curriculum for the university, ran the undergraduate council and did a few other things. And then finally to uh, the graduate school where I was the dean of the graduate school at, uh, for three years before coming up to Weber State University. And people ask me, well, what was the thing that, you got, that, that got you started uh, on that journey? And I say, lightning. And because uh, before I did any of that, um, I was actually in Russia for about six weeks doing a collaborative research project in a little town called Chernogolovka, which is about 80 kilometers northeast of Moscow. Moscow, Russia, not Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> and um, uh, while I was there, I got an email. And uh, it was from the secretary of the Academic Senate. And it said, you have been nominated to uh, stand for president of the Academic Senate. Do you accept the nomination? And without hesitation, I typed, no, thank you. Uh, return, send. <laughs> And it happened that the previous evening, lightning had struck the network at the uh, institute where I was working and knocked out the internet for a week. And so I was elected president of the Academic Senate in absentia, and, and the, the rest is history. <laughs> so that's how I got started. Um, I have a presentation here which is just a series of photographs. It w most of the photographs come from the local Ogden paper as kind of a retrospective of my presidency there. And the only reason I'm showing this to you is because I hope it gives you a sense of uh, the fun 
that I have had as being president of Weber State and the fun that I would hope to have as president of Idaho State University. And there are captions on many but not all of the uh, photographs. And I'll just let this run in the background uh, while we start uh, the question and answer period, if that's okay, just without comment. Ah, and I have to say, please excuse the purple. There's a lot of purple. <laughs> and if you just imagine that everywhere you see or uh, purple, it could be replaced by orange, we'll be fine. <laughs> okay. So uh, with that, I will invite the first question. Okay, please, if you have any questions, uh, use one of these mics. Great. Alan, thank you. You have to press the button on top, I think. It's going. It should be on. Is it on? Is that working? Oh, that's working. <laughs> Good afternoon, President White. I'm Alan France from the College of Education. You are likely aware that ISU has been on the AAUP's sanction list for infringement of governance standards since May of 2011. Please comment on whether this situation concerns you. If not, why not? And if it is a concern for you, what would be your approach to rectifying the problems so that the AAUP can remove the sanction? Thank you. Sure. Uh, I, I was aware of that. And um, although the sanction by the AAUP doesn't have any direct uh, influence on uh, the governance or, or procedures at ISU, it's a black eye, it's a public black eye, and it's a shame. And so uh, to that extent, it does uh, concern me, and uh, I would work uh, to get that with the local AEP chapter first, and then national, uh, to get that sanction removed. Hi, I'm Lynette Mitchell with the Office of Finance and Administration. My question, how would you prioritize financial resources? So there are many aspects of that question. Um, certainly within academic units, uh, resources have to follow students. And so uh, giving, giving uh, academic departments and colleges the opportunity, even the mandate, uh, to be out in uh, the public schools recruiting students to study at their colleges uh, is going to help them uh, get resources for their, colleges, for their college. In a time of declining enrollments, it's really hard to do that. And so I think the, uh, well, I know that the lifeblood of any university is students. And so you have to have students first and the resources will follow uh, the students. Uh, for other areas of the university, uh, allocating uh, monies between uh, divisions, uh, I do that with my five vice presidents and uh, we work collaboratively to do uh, what's most important for the university. That means taking uh, existing base budgets and reallocating portions of those for new initiatives, but it also means moving money across um, divisions uh, to meet compelling needs. And uh, we do that in a very collaborative way. Okay, thank you. Well, have a good afternoon. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dottie. Um, I'm Dottie Sammons from the College of Education. Can you, um, as you've looked at ISU and you've talked to um, different constituents around, can you give us some idea of a, a specific um, what priority or uh, step you might take if you were to take this position? When I made the transition from the University of Utah to Weber State, I had some ideas of things that I wanted to change about Weber State, but um, I caught myself and I committed myself to uh, a listening campaign for 100 days at Weber State before making any big decisions. And it turned out that that was a really good thing for me to do. Uh, because if I had gone into Weber State uh, with 
things that I needed to fix and ideas of what uh, that institution should be based on my experience at other institutions were com which were completely different institutions from Weber State, I would have made some very serious mistakes. And so if I am fortunate enough uh, to come to Idaho State as president, I will again com commit myself to a period of about three months, listening carefully, going around to all of the units I can find, talking with people, listening uh, to what the challenges are, where the problems lie, and discussing with people the best way to fix them. Because I don't know everything. This has to be a team sport. And uh, so I would commit myself to that. Now, in the meantime, there are, are relationships to be built, uh, especially in the community and uh, outside the, the university with legislators and so forth. And, I, and I'm all about building uh, relationships. Um, but in terms of specific changes that I would make at Weber State, at, at uh, Idaho State, um, I, I think I'm gonna just reserve judgment for a little while until I learn more deeply about the institution, because I don't want to make the kind of mistakes that I almost made at Weber State. Um, given that, uh, I think it's um, pretty well known that uh, Idaho State has some challenges around uh, shared governance, and I think that Idaho State has some challenges uh, around uh, enrollments. Uh, and so my listening will be focused uh, more, most strongly on the, pro the problems that are most prominent. And those are two areas where I think I would do a lot of listening very early. Good afternoon, President White. Uh, my name is James Izar, and I'm connected to the Academic Affairs Student Support Services slash Athletic Student Support Services, slash, Staff Council, slash, and also a University Ombuds. So my question for you this afternoon is, if you are selected as our next leader, can you describe the university environment under your leadership related to excellence inclusion principles related to diversity? And how maybe, how maybe each of the areas that I am connected to will look like in relation to identification, recruitment, retention of diverse staff members in the university environment. Hi, James. Thanks for your question. You bet. Um, I hope I can remember, remember, remember it all. Um, so in terms of the environment, um, I believe very strongly that every university must be a leader in its community for economic prosperity and social justice. Diversity is a very important part of, be, of that leadership because no university can be a true leader in its community unless the diversity of the institution reflects the diversity of its community. Beyond that, I believe that um, a university must embrace diversity for educational excellence. The deepest learning experiences that we have in academia are ones where we gather people together to have respectful conference, uh, conversations about our differences. Because if we only talk about the things that are the same or similar to each other, we live in an echo chamber and we don't learn anything. Where we really learn is from learning from our differences. So at Weber State, one of the things that I've tried really hard to do is to build a culture of inclusion. And that means including everybody, not just the people who agree with you, not just the people who look like you, but everybody. And sometimes that's really difficult. Um, we have, I have an assistant vice president for diversity, Adrian Andrews, who's actually right there, actually, good timing. Um, Adrian Andrews is a marvel. She has been fantastic for the university because she gathers people together to have the difficult conversations that we sometimes need to have. It was almost two years ago, well, it actually started uh, early in my presidency, about five years ago, where she helped to facilitate conversations with about 24 different 
uh, groups in Ogden, in the Ogden community, because the Ogden City Council had come to the university and asked for our help in creating a diversity commission for the city. And they wanted to do this so that um, underrepresented groups could have a larger voice in city government. But there was very little trust between those communities and the city government. And so the university helped by brokering some of these conversations and bringing people together. And it took us three years of conversations, almost monthly, to build enough trust for so that when the city council finally did create a diversity commission, it had the trust and support of the city. And that is what given, has given a lot of people in our city a voice in city, an official voice in city government. Um, as far as the campus is concerned, um, I, it's my responsibility as president to set the tone from the top to create an inclusive campus where prospective students and faculty and staff not only feel welcome at our university, but feel like they belong to the university. And it's only then that we can achieve our full potential for ec and, uh, educational excellence. Thank you, James. Mike, go ahead. I'm Mike Ellis, Electrical Engineering. Can you tell us why you're leaving Weber State at this time? Sure. So I'm a person who always likes to have a challenge in life. Um, and I, I, my first challenge was to become a, a chemist uh, and become a faculty member and, and get tenure and start rising through the ranks. But uh, I learned to be a long distance runner and I was a pretty good marathon runner for a while. Uh, and then I started running ultra marathons, 100 milers and, and did pretty well at that. I don't do that anymore. You, residents just don't have time uh, f to train for those sorts of things. But then I learned to be a Java programmer and I write educational software online. And then I became a pilot uh, and I've, uh, I'm a commercially rate rated pilot and uh, fly all over the Western United States. I'm always challenging, my, challenging myself to do new things and learn new things. And so um, after, when I first came to Weber State, I set out five priorities for my presidency. Keeping college affordable, uh, building uh, diverse, a level of diversity at, at our campus that reflects the diversity of our community, um, building a beautiful and sustainable campuses, leveraging technology to improve teaching excellence and building great relationships with the communities. And I spent a lot of time doing those things and got the institution to a point where not everything is done, not everything is perfect, but it was kind of leveling off. And I was finding that I was coasting a little bit in my job and I, did, I never want to do that. So I made a decision early on for lots of reasons, but mostly because of that one, um, to leave the university. And I knew that as I was engaged in searches, that some of them, like this one, would be public. And trust me that being here today is pretty challenging for me. There are a lot of people at Weber State who are, who are giving me a bit of a hard time uh, for interviewing for this job at Idaho State. But um, I made the decision back in January to announce publicly that I was stepping down from the presidency at Weber State so that when I was engaged in searches like this, people could hear it from me uh, as a public announcement, as, as part of my commitment to transparency, and not hear it from because somebody at Idaho State or another institution called them to ask what, what the heck was I doing interviewing for uh, a presidency somewhere else. So, Basically, it's I made the decision and I'm all in, and so here I am. Hi, I'm Tom Klein in the English department. I can promise you that we can present you with some challenges if you wish. Good, that's what I'm up for, that's what I live for. So one of them is um, uh, we seem to lag behind our peers uh, in terms of retention of students and graduation rates. In fact, the, the, the figures are, are kind of depressing when you uh, dig down into them. Um, and I'm curious what, what you might do to, to increase student retention. And uh, just as a part of that, something that doesn't get much conversation is the fact that um, male students uh, 
are uh, disproportionately small. So, so obviously, um, uh, having a, a degree uh, correlates to lots of, uh, you know, positive outcomes. So, so I would say that the we should be concerned that in Idaho, um, much fewer fewer men are getting degrees than than women. And I just wondered if you comment on that. Yeah. So fewer men getting degrees than women is a national trend, and there are a lot of people worrying about where what's happening to men. Um, but um, my wife tells me, assures me that women are just generally smarter than men, and so <laughs> I should just live with it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, the first part of your question was uh, about enrollments uh, or student success. Retention, okay. Um, so at Weber State, uh, two and a half years ago or so, um, we looked at our en overall enrollments and they were kind of flat and that was not okay. And so we embarked on a journey uh, with a consultant from R uh, Ruffalo Noel Levitz and we spent a million dollars up front to, f to try to figure out um, what to do about our enrollments. And it turns out that the easiest and the cheapest and the best thing that you can do to increase your enrollments is to, con is to increase the level of student success and retention of students you already have. It's not necessarily about recruiting new students from the community or from out of state or internationally. It's just doing better with what you have. And so we, we started in on uh, implementing a bunch of things, uh, had difficult conversations with our faculty, uh, got everybody on board, and now those things are working. And so last fall, we were up 1.2% uh, in budget-related enrollments. We were up uh, about 5% in headcount, but in, in the real money things that count, about 1.2% 1 and we're higher than we'd ever been uh, before. In spring, we were up 2.2% uh, year over year uh, from the, the previous year, from last year. And uh, the early indications for um, next year are that we could be up as much as 3% because some of our new recruiting um, efforts are starting to kick in and to succeed. And so I don't know yet um, what you have done or haven't done at Idaho State, but I'm absolutely convinced as a president that uh, improving student success, improving student retention until graduation, you want them to go away and succeed after that, but um, uh, improving student retention early on to, and persistence to graduation is one of the most important things that we can do. Um, the six-year graduation rate at Idaho State isn't great, it's not great at Weber State either. Um, and uh, probably for different reasons. And so part of my listening campaign is gonna be to dig more deeply into some of those reasons and figure out just exactly what things we need to do to increase student success. Thank you. Uh, Jim DeSanza, I'm Chair in Communication, Media, and Persuasion. Uh, first of all, as a teacher of leadership, I can't thank you enough for talking about the word fun. Uh, as a leadership professor, I know how important fun is for creative people to do their best work. And the words fun and ISU haven't appeared in the same sentence here in many years. So I'm sure thank you for that. Um, as you know, I, undoubtedly you've done some research. We've experienced quite a number of, of serious crises. There's a corruption scandal at the Rye Center. As you mentioned, declining student enrollment, and uh, uh, there was an introduction of uh, a lot of Middle Eastern students. The faculty never had even a heads up that this was going to occur. I believe that all of these things could have been avoided had the administration actually listened to faculty, staff, students, and the community. I'm a little selfish, so I'll focus on faculty here. Can you just name a couple of things you'll do to repair the relationship with the faculty? <laughs> sure. So. Um, maybe I'll tell this in the form of a story, uh, and, and that is um, when I first got to Weber State uh, in my first year, I made a presentation. I, I go to all, all of the um, faculty senate meetings when I'm in town, when I can, and I give a report from the administration, and we have some difficult conversations about things like uh, student retention rates and graduation rates and things like that. Um, but in my first year, I gave a presentation on uh, some remodeling that we wanted to do in our Stewart Library. And it was a result of 
uh, facilities management coming to me and saying, you know, there's a lot of stuff behind the walls in the HVAC system that need to be fixed, and and we want to do that. But we also want to spruce things up inside the walls as well and move things and things around. And so I went to the faculty senate, which is one of the main conduits of uh, communication between our administration and our faculty, and I presented the sketch of the idea. We hadn't gotten to a design stage or engaged an architect or anything like that. But I gave a sketch of, of what we wanted to do and I asked for input. And I was surprised to get none. And um, so I said, you know, really we want to hear from you. If you have comments or suggestions or if you think this is a terrible idea, tell us. Um, and I got no, nothing back. And so I gave FM, uh, the facilities management, the green light to proceed with the project, and they started in. Um, and then a couple of months later, I became aware that there were some petitions circulating among our faculty about how bad an idea this was, and you know it, it, the remodel plan was terrible. And I immediately called the chair and vice chair of the faculty senate in, and I said, what is going on? You know, I, I went to you, I asked for input, I got none, um, and now I've got petitions. And they said, well, some people might have thought that, you know, this was just a courtesy call and it was actually a done deal, a fait accompli. And I said, no, 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 no. When I ask for your input, I really want it to, to help me from making a mistake. So I told FM, stop everything. And we stopped for two years while we went back to the students and the staff and the library and the faculty and collected all of the input that we really needed uh, for this project. And they finally told us what was wrong about the previous plan and, and how to do it better. There wasn't complete agreement on everything, but we took all that input and came up with a new plan for that renovation that uh, we then started up again after two years and was finally finished almost exactly one year ago. And we have a beautiful library that people love. And so having that open and honest communication uh, with the faculty, with the staff, even with students, is an incredibly important part of administration because I don't know everything. I don't know the truth or the best thing about everything. It's important for me to gather information to, to distill different points of view and come up with a reasonable plan that might be a compromise between a, a bunch of different things. But that helps me from making important mistakes. And so that kind of communication is what I need as president. Dr. Bryden, please. I'm uh, Bill Bryden, retired pediatrician, retired almost everything. And as I was <clears throat> looking at your pictures, um, I noticed that you were wearing a yellow snake instead of a purple one. Couldn't <laughs> you find a purple snake? <laughs> <laughs> so that picture was taken early in my presidency when a group of students just asked me to come up to uh, the student union to meet with them. And as soon as I walked in the door, those two enormous snakes were put over my neck and a, a group of students stood in a semicircle around me taking pictures and posting them on Facebook and Snapchat and so forth. And, and I'm not a big fan of snakes, but <laughs> this was okay until one of them sort of disappeared inside my uh, coat and started rummaging around in there. And at that point I said, okay, this is over. <laughs> and we parted friends, but it's fun stuff like that that I've had lots of opportunities to do. Well, my actual question is not my own. Yes, I, I bring this question from my good friend, Joan Downing, who is the librarian, well, assistant librarian here for many years. She's now 99 and didn't figure she could make it today. She, she wanted to come, but she wasn't feeling real good. Anyway, her question is, is one of your priorities to have a liberal arts emphasis at ISU, that is, become educated and learn to think first and then learn to make money. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, if 
if college were all about getting the uh, skills for a particular job, then we would have as many majors as employers and we wouldn't have any liberal education at all. Students these days who I meet coming out of high school, many of them are focused on things that are six inches in front of their nose and it's difficult to get them to expand their horizons to think about the world. And what I think, what, what I sometimes advise students is, you know, take the information that comes to you, seek out additional information, and then connect the dots behind the curtain. Uh, to, and that's the only way that you're actually going to get to the truth of things. And even then, it's going to be difficult. Uh, so a lot of what we do in liberal education is to expose people to new, new ideas, new concepts, new ways of thinking uh, that, that are foreign to what they have already learned or what they might learn in one particular major. And it's so important for two reasons. One is it helps you become a complete person, not just a person that can do one, one job. But the other thing, which is a little bit more subtle, is that when, when most of us in this room graduated from college, um, we were among people who were graduating and would have one career in their lives. When students graduate from college today, they're probably going to have three or four different careers. And so they are going to have to be lifelong learners. Learning to be a chemist is not enough. Learning to be an electrical engineer or a philosopher or an anthropologist is not enough. You have to have a broad education to help you learn the next thing as it comes along, whether it's being a pilot or a Java programmer or an electrical engineer or whatever it is. Liberal education is the doorway to future learning. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Russell Wall. I'm in the uh, College of Arts and Letters in the English and Philosophy Department. I appreciate your answer to the last question and I think what I'm asking is going to be related to that. About three years ago, maybe a little more, we all went through a program prioritization uh, here at ISU and uh, <clears throat> It was it was very demanding, and I understand we're in the process of going through another one fairly soon. And uh, one of the things that the the uh, the book that they were using as a model for this uh, it had the following design, where you put everything into quintiles, and you just, you either drop or you do something with the lowest quintile. After a while, you know you can see uh, how, how this would affect some of the very things that you were just talking about. Uh, and so uh, one of the frustrations I think that we've had is we worked very hard on the last one, but we keep finding out that the me measures, or as they like to say, metrics, are changing on these things all the time. And uh, I just wondered what your attitude toward this sort of, I'm sure you're familiar with what I'm talking about, yeah. this sort of pro program prioritization, which in fact does suggest that the, uh, the various units of the university are uh, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, you know, specialty stores in a, in in a, in a department store that have to be uh, trimmed according to immediate demand. I would just wonder what your attitude toward that is, and toward the measures that are one one might use to make those sort of evaluations. Thank you. Sure. So, the first thing that you always have to be careful about is you have to be careful what you ask for because you might just get it. Right? And so uh, as people make up various types of metrics to measure performance, generally speaking, people are going to live up to those metrics, but it might not be what you really want uh, in terms of performance. So you have to be very careful about what you ask for. Um, a lot of uh, institutions now are being funded across the country based on graduation rates. And that scares the hell out of me because uh, K, the K-12 system has been uh, under a huge amount of pressure for many years to improve their graduation rates. And you can see uh, K-12 systems dramatically improving their graduation rates, but I guarantee you that some of them are just passing students on through to graduation. And so it becomes about graduation, not about education. And Higher education is the last place I want that kind of play, thing to happen. So um, 
Yeah, there are there are ways, meaningful ways to measure performance, um, but you have to be very, very careful about the metrics that you choose uh, to do that. Well, Northwest has uh, every institution uh, def define metrics and uh, define uh, its criteria for institutional success based on those metrics. And so all of us, uh, Idaho State, Weber State, everybody in the Northwest has had to uh, choose metrics. And you have to do that carefully because a number is certainly going to tell you whether students are successful or not. Um, it's a lot more subtle than that. And so I think we, we just have to be very careful about how we go about doing that. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Kathleen Kangas. I'm from Communication Sciences and Disorders, which is in the health professions. And I was intrigued in reading your uh, summary about your um, one of your accomplishments being a college town charter. Yeah. And I wonder if you could tell us more about that. I'd like to know what that is. Uh, also, specifically, I'd like to know what your role was in bringing that about and what kind of impact that has had on your university. Sure. Um, this is a long story, and I'll try to make it brief according to the instructions, but um, before I got to Weber State, um, there had been kind of a contentious um, relationship between the university and Ogden City, and it had to do in part with um, the relationship that had, ex had existed uh, between the previous president and the previous mayor. And so about a month before I started the job there, uh, I went up to Ogden uh, to visit with the mayor of Ogden, the new mayor. And he and I struck out a, a great relationship from the very beginning. And um, uh, from there, uh, we completed work on a college town charter, which is which is basically just a framework document. It, it sets out ways for the university to communicate with the city and vice versa. Uh, we set up budgets uh, in both institutions to help uh, support initiatives with uh, the other party. Um, and it gave us uh, permission to have difficult conversations with each other. And so, for example, uh, one of the things that the city has helped us with is getting zoning variances on a street that's just on, in a strip of land that's just across the street from Weber State uh, to allow more than uh, three unrelated persons to live in a single dwelling. That is what provides the financial incentives for private parties to come in and construct student housing across the street from the university. It, was, it couldn't pencil financially uh, before that. And so we went with the uh, mayor arm in arm to meetings uh, with the residents who weren't really very happy about this for a lot of reasons and told them our story, told them why we thought this was important for the, for the growth of the university. And even though they didn't really appreciate the, the prospect of having a lot of student cars parked on their streets and a lot of parties in their neighborhood, um, they respected uh, the, the reasons why we were there. And so the city helped us in very important ways get those variances, which is creating new housing uh, in Ogden uh, for Weber State stu uh, University students. More recently, uh, we have uh, partnered with Ogden City and um, uh, five other uh, anchor institutions, including a couple of hospitals, a technology college, a uh, school district, and uh, a health department, to form something called Ogden Community Action Network. And this is a group of seven anchor institutions in our city that are focused completely on an east central neighborhood of Ogden and helping the residents there rise out of poverty. And there are three important initiatives. One is getting uh, better access, access to better housing, uh, access to education, and access to health care. And with these anchor institutions, we are going to tackle all three of those things. And over a period of years, this is a long-term project. We're not going to fix everything in 18 months or even five years. But over a period of years, uh, we are going to tackle those problems in this East Central neighborhood and really fulfill our mission as a university, as a leader in our community.
a leader for our community. And it starts with Weber State is now constructing a community education center in the heart of this neighborhood. And it will have not only educational spaces for classes, it'll have spaces where we help prospective students from the Latino community uh, navigate the process of applying for college, not just at Weber State, but everywhere, and applying for financial aid. And it'll have spaces for the community to have events uh, in this uh, building and it'll have uh, uh, an office for a housing advocate where residents uh, who are in housing can go and just get help with their landlords, get some support uh, from a lawyer, from an institution and help people that way. So um, we are uh, building all kinds of bridges uh, with our community and it is our responsibility to be a leader in our community uh, for economic prosperity and social justice. Great. This will be a last question. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Patricia Overy. I'm with the College of Arts and Letters. And um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and giving us an opportunity to learn more about you. It sounds like you're doing wonderful things for Weber State. And so I have a question. Um, while serving as president of Weber State University, have you ever been faced with a situation in which you made a decision that had a negative impact on the campus? And if so, can you explain what happened? And if given a chance to do over, what would you change? Well, I'm sure that there are people who would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> because all tough decisions are not decisions between right and wrong. They're decisions between right and right. And so there's never universal agreement that you did the right thing. Um, I'm... I'm struggling a bit to come up with a, a, a recent example. Um, fairly early on in my administrative career at the University of Utah, when I was in continuing education, um, I, I made a mistake uh, in announcing a decision about uh, whether that all the uh, raises for a particular year would be merit raises. And um, given where we were in the organization and uh, the amount of money that we had for raises, that was just the wrong decision. And I didn't realize it at first until a couple of people had the courage to come and tell me that I had made a mistake. And when they explained it to me, I realized that, yeah, it had been a serious mistake. And I had, fortunately, I had time to reverse it. And I apologized and just was more thoughtful about decisions after that. I think that you can't expect any person or any president to make perfect decisions, but I think what you can expect is that uh, when somebody, when a president makes a mistake, you should be able to go to that president and say, you know, I think you made a mistake for the following reason, and just talk about it. And you may or may not get a reversal, um, but it's important to have that conversation. And if the president decides that, yeah, it was a mistake, then he or she should absolutely own it and uh, do the best to mitigate the negative um, uh, effects of that mistake and then go on with life. Because uh, life is too short to, to uh, ruminate on, on, on the mistakes. But we all make mistakes. And um, what I try to do is not only learn from my past mistakes, but I try to learn from other people's mistakes. So that's where I am. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. White, for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We'd like to remind you that if you have any comments, please go onto the website, the presidential search, and uh, please uh, do some comments. We, we would enjoy those. Thank you. Have a good day.